Felix Weevil, welcome to Australian Musician. Oh, pleasure to be here, thanks. Uh, you come from a very musical family. Uh, what are your most vivid uh, childhood musical memories? Uh, I think probably a lot of practice, classical music being practiced. My little sister Rosie um, is a composer and classical musician. My little and late brother Max was a countertenor and practiced a lot. My mum was a, was a real lover of um, classical music, so Bach, Mozart, Rachmaninoff, Beethoven, Schubert, Schumann, all of these, these things were being practiced or, or played around the house and that they're very young memories and then I guess um, beside that was um, a lot of 80s rock that, that was playing, you know, Eurythmics, Midnight Oil, uh, Paul Kelly, um, Jimi Hendrix, uh, the Woodstock vinyl was, was big on my playlist, I was given a tape by someone who was doing the gardening um, for us who I just worshipped as a, as a boy, his name was Andrew and he gave me a tape that had, I think the Doors, Jimi Hendrix, uh, the Triffids, um, Cream, I think, um, and, and just, just music that all of a sudden felt more dangerous. So, uh, you know, in, in a broad, sweeping way, a lot of classical music and then, and then sort of counter to that Australian and, and 60s, 70s, 80s rock. Yeah. Yeah. What was the spark that made you decide you wanted to be a performer? Uh, there was a VHS, um, in our drawer back in the days, the kids won't even know what they are, I don't think, um, of uh, Springsteen live clips and, and various video clips and things like that. And, um, and I saw a performance one morning of um, Springsteen playing Rosalita in 1973. Uh, I forget where, but it was just wild. It, it just completely blew my mind. All of these girls ran up on stage while he was performing and were trying to kiss him, and, and he was just this kind of absolute dynamite. Um, kind of lightning bolt of a performer and, and the E Street Band were just playing their hearts out and it was, it was just felt electric and then more than anything um, I thought that looked like so much fun you know it looked like about as much fun as a person could have um, so I'd say that that was pretty informative and um, what else I mean probably the the Afro-Cuban All-Stars and the Buena Vista Social Club movement that happened like in, in the 90s late 90s there um, that really caught my imagination and in a way that, that was much more foreign uh, and, and mysterious to me but I, I, it sort of started a real love I have for Afro-Cuban music and, um, and music from other places you know and, and I think that that probably informed something and last thing I'd say there is meeting Ollie McGill when I was um, about 13 years old he's been a collaborator on just about everything and we put our first band together and at that stage he was playing bass and I was playing drums he soon, you know, came to rehearsal one day and started playing Dave Brubeck, take five on piano, kind of amazingly, and we realised he was going to be a, a keys player. And I sort of slowly made my way into songwriting from there. But that partnership has really um, been with me throughout most of my musical life, and we've we've been in uh, any number of bands together and, and dreamed up the sort of life that we're living now. Yeah, uh, the Cat Empire has provided you with a vehicle to travel the world and, and play music. When you think back at the Cat Empire's career, what are the standout memories for you? Uh, probably, you know, as, as a, I mean, I used to lay awake in bed as a, as a young teenager, I guess, really just dreaming up how to put a band together and what I wanted to do. And at first, it was just just getting a band together and playing in front of people, you know. And, and once we did that, then the bar gets raised a little higher. Um, one of the big memories was playing to a thousand people. There was this kind of this magical number in my head. And the Prince of Wales had a thousand um, person cat. And in the early days of the Cat Empire, we, you know, we sold out one of those shows. And, and that was one of those moments where you kind of, uh, you reach this, this horizon for a moment, you know, and, and just, just feel very ecstatic about that. Um, and then after that, you know, playing a, a first rock festival, I think we did Falls soon after that. and. Um, it was just amazing, you know, playing playing in the afternoon and seeing kind of this this hill just fill up with people, and uh, it was an extraordinary feeling. Uh, the Royal Albert Hall in London was a very special moment for me. I got to sing in the encore with my brother Max, and without realising it, that that really became one of the most precious musical moments of my life, I think. Um, and oh, look, look, any number of things. I, mean, I think seeing people in in these really burst-like, instinctive fragmented ways but just seeing people in full life you know that for a moment people come to Cat Empire shows with this amazing sense of occasion and and just having that those snapshots in different parts of the world with different languages but just colliding with with bright-eyed 
people, you know, and, and being a cause for celebration has been something that I have come to value more and more. Yeah, and, and look, the Cat Empire has provided me with this very colourful um, memory or dream of, of what it is to, to make music and it's a kind of a blessing with that band because we're really not limited by a genre or style particularly, you know, we're there to create a sense of, um, of, of a moving um, celebration of life, I suppose, in, in, in a moment and, and, um, and we can really go in any direction we choose to take that in as long as the, the soul of the night's um, got that spirit to it. And uh, so, so the Canadian Empire has also given me this, this great sense of what it is to move an audience and to be in, in um, this, this great sort of space, this great space where people are, people are moving and, and celebrating the, you know, the occasion of the night. Yeah, I guess uh, people like Ringo Starr saying that Cat Empire is <laughs> one of his favourite bands uh, is not a bad endorsement either. No, I love Ringo. I was really happy with that. He liked the horns in the band. I remember when we got that um, that prop uh, back in the day. It was kind of amazing because you, you, you tend to think of yourself as just in a sort of a bubble as a band and, and very local to Melbourne at that point. And then it's like, oh, how, did, how does Ringo Starr know about us? And uh, turns out he liked the band. Um, we also had the chance to perform with um, James Brown before he passed away. And that was a very special, special thing to actually be around and to meet, um, you know, an icon like that. Uh, yeah, it's 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 nice. I mean, the Cat Empire doesn't really have one demographic at all. It just has it has really really you look out at the crowd. It has such different collections of people, and and it, it's really hard to pinpoint what it is that you know that defines a Cat Empire fan. And I love it like that. In the same way, it's hard to pinpoint what it is um, to describe the music as well. It's more of an atmosphere. So. Yeah, the Cat Empire fans come out of the woodwork and from very unexpected places. Yeah. Uh, Blues Fest this year was very special for you. It was the final performance of the original lineup of Cat Empire. Uh, you also performed with Spinifex Gum, which mm -hmm. you collaborated with, and they That's went right. down really well. Yep. Um, also, you must have had your brother's health in the back of your mind at the time. Um, tell me about your mindset during Blues Fest this year. Uh, it was an incredible, incredibly intense time. Um, I was very determined to to really honour the original lineup of the Cat Empire, so I felt quite a, a sense of um, privilege and and um, nervous energy around that. And I think we did a it was the right place for that original lineup to to send off. Um, Spin Effects Gum is a project that I absolutely adore, and, and working with Malia, um, it's the choir that fronts Spin Effects Gum, is. You know, just such an such an honour and such an exciting thing to be part of. But it's very nerve wracking at a festival because um, they're not necessarily experienced with what a changeover, you know, a twenty minute changeover, no sound check involves. And so any technical uh, things, because I'm not I only perform once I'm in that show, so I'm not nervous about performing. I'm just nervous about everything coming together. And then it, it's always this this intense moment just before the show we go, are they going to be alright, are they going to get the first note, are they going to come in together and then when they do it's this enormous relief, you know, and and that project uh, and those young um, women in Malia, or girls and young women I should say, um, just knock people sideways, they do, you, you know, I saw the tent, it was, was about a third full at the beginning and by the end just absolutely packed and, and um, a lot of people saying that that was sort of a highlight of their festival and, and so I'm very proud of what um, what those young singers are able to do every time they perform. And in the background of, this happened on the one night, you know, the first Spinifex come performance of Blues Fest and the last Cane Park performance of Blues Fest happened within, you know, two hours of each other. And at the same time, my brother um, was, was in the last few weeks of his life, he'd been battling horrible brain cancer and, and um, had taken a turn for the worse. And so all of that, um, that joy and, and that exuberance that comes with the performance once you manage to do it, was also um, it was also very filled with 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 a terrible panic and sadness as well that that um, that, that happens. I, I suppose all I'd say about that is that I'm, I've come to realise that music is is an exceptional thing because it's able to embrace a lot of varying emotions. You know, it's not you're not in one state when you perform music. You when when you're able to be in a collective of a crowd and and amongst songs that you've um, you've written and that you hear sung back to you in a different light that, that is the case with Spinifex coming the Cat Empire. It's just, um, 
it's amazing. You can take this, the, probably the most awful sadness that I've ever known, uh, and, and be in, in a space of joy simultaneously. And, and that's, a, that's ultimately for me a wonderful thing. Um, but it was, it, was, it was a very, very intense time, yeah. yeah. Um, I fast forward to uh, November um, 2022, and you've got a new solo album out, Every Day Amen. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it was created uh, quite some time ago. Yeah, we recorded this album in this, this beautiful few weeks in uh, January 2020, before I knew what COVID was, while the Melbourne skies were shrouded in, in smoke from the fires. Um, we were at Sing Sing Studios in South Melbourne with Andy Baldwin producing and Rosso and arranging and, and a fantastic band. Danny Ferruccio on drums, Ben Edgar on guitar, uh, Ryan Monroe on bass, um, Ollie McGill um, playing organ and, and synths and, um, and I was playing keys and singing mostly. Just a free-flowing fantastic recording and, and, and one that seemed to be able to traverse um, a lot of outward international fragments and colours, you know, like I mentioned that, that probably came from that memory or dream of the years touring with the Cat Empire and, and also something that was really celebrating um, a kind of a magic, sublime, domestic space where, where, where normal things can, can occasionally turn on their head and I think that's sort of where the songs hovered between, between this domestic world that was equally as kind of surprising and curious as, as a far more overt, outward, you know, international world and um, and, and, and the songs kind of played themselves and it was just one of those really beautiful recordings. And then, you know, within months, we were in, um, we were in the UK about to head to Spain when the world completely turned on its head within the space of about a week, you know, and, and so the tour was canceled, shows for about two years were canceled. We got one of the last flights out from, um, from Heathrow, I think, um, just people in hazmat suits. It's one of the craziest plane rides I've ever been on. There's this panic, widespread panic, and just, it's just, crazy and came back to this space. I had to um, quarantine for two weeks then I think. And had the first break that I'd had and, and you know, um, a long way of saying that, that it didn't feel right to release this Everyday Amen album in the midst of, of a Melbourne lockdown. You know, it felt like this was a more optimistic album than that and something I, I wanted to perform live and not just on a, you know, weird performance Zoom scenario. And, and I, um, yeah, so I sat on it for a few years, and now now it's really surprising me, and it's it's lovely to it feels like the right time to let it out into the world. Was every day, amen, always going to be the title track? I think so. It seemed like the obvious one. I mean, that track, every day, amen, is um is very. It starts off very intimate and close, and then it turns into something that's um quite orchestral, and then at the end, sort of it's a two step punky or something like that. It's just got a it's got sort of an overture feeling to it and it's it's got a, a sense of humour and it's got probably a lyrical bent in it that seemed to um, be the best introduction to the, to what the album was trying to do and uh, yeah, it, it felt like a very natural name. Yeah, uh, it has a huge uh, brassy climax <laughs> at the end. Are you hesitant at all about using brass in your solo music because it's such an integral part of can it or it doesn't no, I, I, I think there was probably a time in my life where um, those boundaries between solo projects and the Cat Empire were, were more kind of pronounced. Uh, but now it's not. I, I really think, and perhaps this is part of where I'm at now, and an and, and experience of music taking me to this point that I don't. I really don't think about um, Cat Empire and solo and spin effects gum as all entirely separate. It's, it's the world that I inhabit. I love writing music. Um, I find a great joy in writing music and, and, a, and a purpose and something that can, can carry me through um, many different um, periods of life. You know, it, it, when I'm feeling miserable, I write music. When I'm feeling very happy, I write music. And, and everything that's in between, I tend to find myself writing music. So the, you know, if, if a song wants brass, it's going to have brass, basically. And, and if that song finds its way into a Cat Empire album or a solo album, it doesn't worry me. Yeah. Uh, another song, Liar, uh, has a kitchen sink in it, <laughs> production-wise. Um, yeah. Are you hearing that stuff when you're writing? A lot of it. I mean, Liar was one that we always wanted to, to give that, um, that sort of Melbourne house party trash bag sort of feel to it. Um, we wanted it to be really... Rough, and it was fortunate for me because 
when I performed that song, I had one of those great chest colds. You know, usually they're not good for singers, but in this case, it let me sing, you know, probably a couple of notes lower than I usually would, and then let me get over that weird point where, you, where your voice stops and sing a couple of notes higher than I usually would. So it, it's in a key that, that I'm not sure if I'd be able to emulate live, um, but it did give it that growl and that screech that, that is so much part of that, you know, part of that song. It's like a late night couple screaming at each other across the park. You want to get that kind of, that kind of impact in, in that chorus. And, um, and then the other thing about Lyra I'd say is it's probably a, there's probably a personal in-joke for me that's, that relates to what I told you about growing up, that with all that classical music in the, in the family, we, instead of going to an obvious guitar solo in, in the middle of that song, we thought, oh, let's have this, this trashy drum sort of muted in the background and we'll put a, a few, a, you know, a string quintet over the top of that. It's, it's just a really nice sort of counterpoint. So there is that reference to my um, musical upbringing in there that I kind of think was, was sort of funny. And I did imagine that and, and Ross liked the idea and so, you know, I didn't arrange those strings. Ross did. He's a fantastic arranger and, and sort of takes control of it once the initial ideas and, and the song bones are in front of him kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, Barcelona Beers, uh, tell me who the female voice is and how that track came about. Uh, so Barca Beers is featuring the voice of Jo Bell, who's a French, um, beautiful French songwriter and sort of indie artist doing some, some great things and I'd heard her voice listening around and thought that, that she would make a nice, um, a nice other character. The context of the song I think is probably based around a touring world, you know, something it's it's an imaginary scenario in Barcelona, um, sort of going out into the into a blazing sort of a night and and, and thinking that, that you'll never get back there again. And and on tour this is very much the case with shows. You sort of you forget it by the next morning, you know, this this quite quite amazing um, and otherworldly experience that, that it often is sort of being being that delirious and sweaty and, and, and in music on stage and then the next morning it's like what happened last night I, I won't never get back there again and then you get to the next city and then slowly you work your way through the day and by the time the lights come on and you get back on stage you go like oh I'm back here you know it's it's kind of just one of those strange um, dreams that you, you forget and, and you only remember again when you're back in it sort of thing so look the song is yeah it, it, it is the context of, of um, a night out in Barcelona um, that I could have had at any point and Joe Bell sings with this accented French voice that um, I thought was really really kind of alluring and, and uh, attractive in, in the track and, and yeah she did a wonderful job. Yeah. Um, what's the track order important to you? Is that something you agonise over? I do yeah I'm, I'm very I'm very old-fashioned like that I think. I, I really still um, love the uh, the album order. I'm not sure how relevant that is today in, in the streaming world but there's something about set lists and then uh, there's something about album orders that um, I do agonise over a lot. I, I love the idea of a flow, you know, that you get there. Each song has its own arc and then um, I'd like a collection of songs chosen to have their own arc as well. Yeah. Are you good at knowing when a song is done and to leave it alone? I think I'm getting better at that. Um, I think that's one of the, the things that you, you keep on um, refining as you, you gain some experience in this life of music and that is often um, adding more doesn't necessarily make it more powerful and sort of learning where the right balance is. Having said that, I mean, uh, I, I love working with Andy Baldwin who, who produced this album, was also the producer on the New Cat Empire album that we've just um, finished tracking. And and he's a, he's a very over the top producer. He loves sounds, he loves plugins, he loves um, a sense of just an overflowing kind of sonic experience and, and I find that very attractive too a lot of the time but there is a sort of a um, an experience you get where you where you can um, not feel so anxious as to think that just adding more is necessarily better and, and when a song's done if the vocals really telling you know the right emotion and the right story and the things around that are, are kind of in place and adding adding the right amount of excitement that's um, yeah it, it, it's a, a really good thing to keep on practicing mm -hmm. so I think I'm getting better at it. Mm. Yes. Tell me about this piano that you write on. This um this piano is over a hundred years old. It's a Bluthner. It was my grandfather's on my mother's side, um, who I never met. He died when um, my mum was still a teenager. Um, but he was an ad man, and he wrote a lot of jingles. I think quite a few famous jingles were written on this piano. And um, it, it has a very unique action, it has a sprung steel action as opposed to you know the more popular Steinway action. 
and so it has quite a light touch. Um, and yeah, look, many, many songs have been written on this instrument for me. It's funny because I mean, I, I think Everyday Men was, was definitely written on this piano. And the new Cat Empire album, I've actually, I haven't played it for a long time. I've, I've got a lot of my guitars um, converted to Cuban Trez tuning and, and, and those things. And so I've really been, been sort of throwing myself into a new instrument there, which has been wonderful to, um, to also write songs from a very different perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. some of the other tools you use in your songwriting. Do you use DAW, for instance? DAW? Do you, uh, digital audio workstation? Do you, ah, digital audio workstation. Do you record yourself? I do. I'm, I'm, not, look, I'm, not a very, um, I'm not a very great sort of computer sonic person, but I can hack my way around um, Pro Tools and I, you know, I can make demos and I think it's almost good that I'm not so proficient at it because you, I just make bare bones demos and it's sometimes good to hear what a drum part would sound like or a percussion part or a, um, you know, a song shape that you can sort of edit around and, and work to. Um, and if it's not so good then, then whoever's listening to it can just use their imagination in it as opposed to something that's almost realised and, and you, you get caught in that, that funny middle zone. But look, mostly the pleasure of writing music for me is, is in the imaginary space, so with an instrument, with very, very bare bones notes. I, I have like a million voice memos, I mean that's sort of the main thing I use, just to work on songs and to keep on um, throwing ideas at them and, and then once it's in my head and once the lyrics are written on a page and the chords are there, um, then sometimes I make a demo, sometimes I just play to, you know, people who I trust, um, who I know can take it to a, another level like that and then, and then they do. Uh, but I don't love having my, my head in a computer. I, I find that to be a little bit, uh, just not the place I'm drawn to. I'm, yeah. I, I like being, being with an instrument. Yeah. Um, I imagine you'll take this album on the road. Um, have you thought about how these songs will translate to a live situation? Oh look, we did, a, um, we did a great rehearsal the other day and it's a fantastic group of musicians performing. I mean, I feel very, very blessed in my life to have grown up in such a vibrant city with such a fantastic generation of musicians around me. I, I really feel like I was um, very lucky like that. And, and, so, and I also have a lot of experience now with, with musicians who I, I trust and love and have, have great life experience with. So I, you know, I've, I've given the reins to Ross to um, help assemble this band. They're, most of the people who performed on the studio um, version of these songs are performing on stage. I've also met a few fantastic others. There's going to be seven or eight musicians um, performing these early shows, and, and I think it's going to sound dynamite. Yeah. So what's the grand plan for Felix Rebel? I to keep on writing writing music. I, I feel um, that there's a there's a real sense of uh, enjoyment and presence in music that I have now um, that keeps on becoming more interesting you know I think I have a love of music that's greater than it's ever been at the moment and I think it can continue to grow like that and uh, so really it's not uh, when I was younger I had uh, ambitious plans about I want to you know I want to play to a thousand people I want to play to, you know and then I want to release a record and it doesn't really manifest like that for me and I'm in a fortunate position because I've, I've had a career in music so far that's allowed me to really focus on on the essence of songwriting for me and to try and get better as an instrumentalist and as a singer and as a um, writer and to keep on going deeper in that and then trust the people around me to, to let the journey take me where it's going to go. I, I think that's that's my my approach at the moment. Um, so the Cat Empire's got a great, great new album coming out with, with I think something, you know, between 40 and 80 musicians. 80 if you count the, the wind symphony that we got in for one track, but 40 from, from all around, you know, really Brazilian percussion sections, West African percussion sections, um, 10 strings on tracks, 10 horns on tracks, you know, just as really kind of larger than life and that was just, it's been an amazing process. So that album, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the next chapter of the Cat Empire. And um, and this solo album, I'm, I'm very proud of and, and I think that um, I 
you know, I can be in a, in a different space on stage with this band and, and really enjoy that. And uh, Spin Effects Gum just keeps on keeps on giving, you know, that it, those, like I said, those girls and young women in Malia are just an amazing group of people and Lynn Williams is a fantastic operator, Deborah Brown, fantastic choreographer, Ollie McGill, oldest musical companion, um, Michael Woodley, uh, CEO of the Injibani Aboriginal Corporation as a cultural advisor and songwriter and things like that, just fantastic people that, that are, um, you know, very, very much part of my life now. And um, so, you know, with, with people like that around and, and, and projects like that, I feel very blessed, really, just to, um, to write songs and do what I can do well and let, let the people around me do what they do really well and, and see what, what emerges. Yeah, well, Felix Rickle, thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for the interview.